Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here. If you will, we're going to stand and open with our call to worship, Psalm 67. Psalm 67. It says, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. omniscient God all knowing in his wisdom doth ordain every working of creation to the glory of his name who is thoughts can dare to fathom who is judgments can contain none is equal unassailable he our God who ever reigns God all keep omnipresent in the passing days of man first to last not one forgotten by his strong and did a ransom to the glory of his name and now ascribe unending worship now ascribe immortal praise to the god whose kingdom cometh blessed be his matchless name and now ascribe unending worship now ascribe Please be seated and open with me, if you would, to the 16th chapter of the book of John. As we look, as we look where the apostle writes down the words of Christ as he describes the coming Holy Spirit. And what he describes in John chapter 16 is the benefit that the the church 
And specifically here, the apostles will receive when Christ ascends into heaven, saying that when he leaves, he will send the Spirit, and the Spirit will do great, mighty, and powerful things. And if we recall, shortly after this, Christ does ascend, Pentecost comes, and we see the Holy Spirit moving mightily through right there, the people of Jerusalem. And over those next few weeks, thousands of people come to know the Lord. We think about that in relation to what we recognize that right now 12 from our own congregation are en route between Quito, Ecuador to Chunchi, Ecuador. And we pray and we believe that this same Holy Spirit will go in front of them and make way uh, the peoples to whom they will come into contact. So let's read together John chapter 16 beginning in verse 7 as Christ describes this coming Holy Spirit. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are the recipients of this then promised Holy Spirit. And we thank you that the words that you gave to your apostles were so true and are so true today. That he does convict the world. That he does draw us. That he teaches us. Or that he softens our hearts to your truth as he softens the hearts of all those who would ever call on you to your truth. Father, and we pray that specific request for the people that our group will come into contact with over the next week. Father, we pray that you will soften the hearts of those whom you are calling. That you will open the minds and open the eyes to truth, Father. That we'll be declared from the lips of your servants who are privileged to be called your children that have been sent out from this congregation. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to participate in your work, for the honor of being able to be your servants, to speak truth into a world, Father, that needs to hear this truth so desperately, Father, and and a world that you are causing to continue to change. Father, as you call out your people, as you call out your church, as you change their hearts through your gospel, that we believe, that we proclaim, and that we rely upon. Father, now as we return worship and praise to you, Lord, would ask that it would be a pleasing aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, Father, from a people who loves you greatly. Father, for we love you and we do praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship together. Come thy fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song And sung by flaming tongues Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hold by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought 
From sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, clothed in, in the blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Oh, come, my Lord, no longer tarry, bring thy promises to pass, for I know. I'm home with thee at last. Well, come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass. For I know thy power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. Amen. Children, you are dismissed.
Father, we thank you again for this glorious morning that we can gather together, that we can rejoice in the treasure that we possess in your truth, in your salvation, in the hope that we have forever. And so we pray now, uh, Lord, that you'd be glorified, that you would speak to us, press in upon us, convict us, strengthen us. And Lord, we thank you again for how good you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God of truth. Father, you give us the understanding we need by your Spirit to understand the truth of the gospel of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you have given us the understanding that we are sinners, that we are hard-hearted, children of wrath, your enemies. But we also know that you've given us the truth that we need Jesus. That he is the one who was born of a virgin. He is the eternal one who lived a perfect life. He is the perfect one who was slain for the sins of his people. He's the powerful one that rose from the dead and after 40 days ascended to your right hand. And Father, we know that in your perfect timing, he will come and gather his bride. These are just a few of the gospel truths that we believe, that we stand on, and that we ask that you help us proclaim to the nations. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, this small letter is the third letter of the Apostle John. 
It's one that, like I've mentioned earlier, we don't look at a whole lot because, you know, you've got the whole book of Romans, you've got Ephesians, you've got Galatians. The Bible is just full of rich gospel truth, and this is just tucked away in the back. But when we open it up, when we unpack it, we see the beauty and the practicality of this letter and the truth that John writes about here. It's not hard to figure out the theme of this letter. It is the truth. Uh, the truth is mentioned seven times in verses 1. It's mentioned in verse 3, verse 4, verse 6, verse 12. So the whole letter is an unpacking of how Gaius, this beloved brother of John, is living out the truth. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, the truth, the tie that binds. The truth is what unites us as the body of Christ. The truth is what we all believe as we are born again and, and baptized into the church. We are all affirming the truth of the gospel. And this morning, I want us to look at this in two parts. We're just going to look at the first half of the letter, verses 1 through 8. And then next week, we'll pick up 9 through 15. But I want to look at this in two parts. The first is this, that John is calling Gaius, his beloved brother, to walk in the truth. So we'll look at what it means to walk in the truth. Secondly, we'll see what it means to work together for the truth in the, first, in the second half. And that's the way we'll consider the letter. Now, as we begin, you can't help but notice that as you look at this letter and you look at the way the apostle writes it to Gaius, that not only is Gaius walking in the truth, but he is loving in the truth. He is loved in the truth. Look at verse 1. John writes, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And notice what he does in verse 2. Then he turns around again and says, Beloved. Is there any doubt in your mind of how John feels about Gaius? He loves him. Now, I know you may be asking the question, how do we know this is John? John simply introduces himself as the elder when he opens the letter. Now, since early church history, this letter has been affirmed as to be of the Apostle John as the other three. So there's really never even been a, a question from, from times long ago. But I, I had to think about this in this letter and the way he introduces himself to Gaius and to the church that would have heard this letter. He simply says the elder. Now think about John a minute. Think about all the ways John could have opened this letter up. Especially when you look at the second half of the letter and you see that he's going to have to confront Diotrephes about his desire to be first. But John just simply opens the elder. He could have opened John the apostle. Right? Paul did that. When Paul wanted them to know, the, the churches to know, hey, he has apostolic authority, he introduced himself as the apostle of Christ. But John doesn't do that. John could have introduced himself as John, the one whom Jesus loved. Right? That'd get your attention if he's writing a letter. And he refers to himself like that throughout the whole gospel of John. My personal favorite, and if I was doing it, I'd probably done this. John, the son of thunder. Because he's going to have to come with some volume in the second half of the letter. And we'll see it. But John didn't do that. John simply said the elder. Now this letter was probably written around 90 to 95 AD. So John was an aged man. So John is an elder pastor at the time. John is an older man who is still a pastor. But he hadn't quit. He is still doing what God has called him to do. He is still writing letters to the churches to help improve the health of the churches. He is still probably preaching and teaching in his local context, wherever he's at. But you know what he hadn't done? He hadn't retired. He's still going. And y'all, we get so focused on what we're going to do when we retire, I think we forget we really don't retire as believers. We are still called to preach the gospel. We are still called to do God's work. And I, was, I saw a modern-day example of this a few weeks ago watching a, a, a counseling podcast. Andy watched it with me. Um, a guy named Wayne Mack. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of Wayne Mack. But he's written books like Strengthening Your Marriage, Life in the Father's House. He was part of MacArthur Seminary out in California, a, a professor, a biblical counseling expert, if you'd like to call him that. At 70 years old, he moved from California to South Africa. Because he said the church needed teaching on biblical counseling. Oh, I'll be honest. That 70, I don't plan on moving to Africa. But that's what the gospel does in the life of in the hearts of men. When God calls us, he calls us to the end. 
And that's what we see in the life of the Apostle John here. So we see a man who has a shepherd's heart. We see a man that loves his brother Gaius. And again, you look at this, the way he opens this letter to Gaius. Beloved, whom I love in the truth. And then again, beloved. It's like he says it doubly, right? I, I really love Gaius, if you couldn't tell. But think about that today. If Pastor James were to write to Lewis and said, Beloved, the one I love in the truth, Lewis is getting uncomfortable just thinking about it. <laughs> but that's, that's because we have lost this idea of what it means for Christians to love one another. We've lost this truth of what the gospel does in the hearts of men when we're born again. And John is revealing this to us. And he, he hits it in verse 2, beloved, verse 5, beloved, and verse 11, beloved. He loves this man. Listen to what Sean O'Donnell writes. He says, He possessed the necessary doctrinal, ethical, and relational aspects of genuine Christian faith. He believed in the apostolic message, obeyed the apostolic teachings, and opened his heart and home and wallet to the apostolic ambassadors. He says he aced the three tests of 1 John. Y'all remember what those are? The obedience test, the love test, and the doctrinal test. He says, guys, I aced them all. He was a faithful man to the truth. He lived in accordance with the truth. He preached the truth. He loved in the truth. Y'all, the truth is what binds us together. Again, it's not just, it is biblical, and that's the most important, but it's logical. The more truth we agree on, the more unified we're going to be. The minute we start disagreeing on this truth, disagreeing on that truth, then all of a sudden there comes division. Then all of a sudden there comes divisiveness between the brothers and sisters. But the more truth we affirm, the closer we are in fellowship with one another. And we see this with John and Gaius. Gaius, again, we don't know much about Gaius. He, th it was a common name in the New Testament times. Um, there, there's a Gaius in Romans. I think there's one in Acts. But we don't have enough information to connect this Gaius to any other. So it's simply a man of God, a faithful churchman, a faithful church leader, whom the apostle loved in truth. And what a beautiful example. John MacArthur writes this. He says, love and truth are inseparable. And love is built upon truth. Truth always governs the exercise of love. That's why truth is spoken of in verse 1, 3, 4, 8, and 12. They were both in truth. Now, we are to love all people in the world in, in an evangelistic way. We're to love them in a sense that we care about their souls the way God loves the world. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking here about love that is unique to those who are in Christ and in truth. A special love. A unique bond, a family love among Christians. That is the love of the church. That is the love of those who have been adopted into the family of God. We love one another in a way that no one else does. Look, many of you can probably affirm this. You're probably closer to people in your church than those in your own family at times. Because you have a common bond. You have a bond in Christ that they don't have. You believe truth they don't understand. You are committed to walk in truth they don't understand. And therefore, you are, you are closer to members of your own body than you are your blood, -bought family, or your blood family. Now, as I prayed through and, and meditated on this text and thought about these, these truths that John laces in and out of truth and love, truth and love, this, this hymn came to mind. Um, it's called, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. If y'all will, take your hymnal in front of you and turn to 287. I'm not going to lead us in singing it. Don't, don't worry about that. But sometimes hymns are good to read. Sometimes hymns are good to see the theology that's being taught. Now, I didn't remember who wrote this hymn. I just remember singing it in the Methodist church when I was growing up. Come to find out it was written by a Baptist pastor in the late 1700s. But I think you'll see what I, 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 I saw in this text. Read this first stanza with me. Fawcett writes, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. What binds our hearts together as Christians? A fellowship of kindred minds. 
what we believe about the truth, what we believe about the gospel, that is what unites us as brothers and sisters. Now, again, here's what we need to consider. Would our pastors write to us in that way? Would our pastors write a letter to us saying, Beloved, fill in the blank, whom I love in truth. And then again, Beloved. I think they would. I think you are a people who love the truth. I've only been here four or five months, but I don't see division here. I don't see dissension. I don't see um, arguments against the pastors. I don't see anything that's often seen in the lives of a church. I see a a body committed to their shepherds. I see a body that cares for their shepherds. And I see a body that really loves their leaders because their leaders teach truth, whether it be James or David or or Chip. These are men of God whom we love in the truth. And I believe they love us in the truth. Granted, we need to work on our writing style. We don't write that way anymore, but I think it'd be healthy for us to remember that our pastors love us the way that John loves guys because of our common belief in the truth of the gospel but notice the way that the elder expresses his love it's not just some general you know checkbox yeah i love you man notice what he does he prays in love look at verse two beloved i pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul Y'all, this is a verse we ought to highlight, mark, circle, memorize. When we think about the way we ought to pray for one another, it spells it out as beautifully as I've ever seen. It gives you kind of three ways that we should be praying for one another, three ways that the elder prays for guys, three ways that we can pray for our missionaries that just left to go to Ecuador. And notice, first of all, in the first part of the verse, he prays for wellness and circumstances. He says, I pray that all may go well with you. What would that include? If somebody said, hey, I pray that all goes well with you. Well, it includes almost everything going on in your life. It includes your family life. It includes your work life. It includes your your church life. It includes anything that you can imagine that's going on at that time in your life that is important. We ought to pray for one another. But to do that, we really have to understand one another more, right? If you're going to pray that all may go well with my circumstances, you need to know some of my circumstances. I need to know some of your circumstances. That means we need to talk more. That means we need to fellowship more. We need to get to know one another more so we can pray just for general well-being of each other. But notice what he does next. He prays for wellness in body. He says, and that you may be in good health. Now, this is an area we hit pretty hard. I'd say we really do a good job about praying for the sick. If you consider our prayer meetings, if you consider our family prayers, our individual prayers, we often are praying for those who are sick, those who may be facing death, those who have been injured. And hey, that's a good and right thing to do. But that's not what John's doing here. We don't have any reason to believe guys are sick. But he prays, hey, I'm praying that you may be in good health. You know what, our team in Ecuador right now, we need to pray that they stay in good health. They left in good health yesterday. But over the last 30 hours, they've been in three different planes. They've been in three different airports. They've been around each other really closely. So we need to pray that the Lord would grant them favor and keep them in good health while they're on this trip. We need to pray that they would stay healthy and able to minister the gospel in in the country of Ecuador. We need to do that for one another. You know, we need to start telling each other, hey, I'm doing pretty good, but I got this coming up. Can you pray that I'd I'd stay healthy for this? Or whatever the case may be. Now, can you already see if we do these things by name for one another, what will it do to our prayer life? Is it going to grow? Is it going to get deeper? Are we going to be on our knees more? Absolutely. But notice the last thing he says. He prays for wellness and soul. He says, as it goes well with your soul. Now, here's something I think we all need. We we can take some encouragement here, right? We often pray for the souls of the lost. And, hey, I need to do that more. But that's not what he's doing here. 
he's praying for the soul of this man who's a church leader, a man who may be a pastor, a man who's well-respected. And he's saying, hey, I'm praying that all goes well with your soul, that all goes well with the innermost part of your being, the immaterial part of who you are, your desires, your affections, those things you love, those th- your goals, all these things that come from your seat of emotions in essence. I pray that it goes well. Now you're talking about getting to know somebody at a different level. When you say, hey, how can I pray for your soul? What are your fears? What are your concerns? What are your cares? Do you see now the way the church is being strengthened by praying in the truth, by praying in love, by walking in the truth? Now look, look back at your hymn. I hope you didn't put the hymn books up. Look at the second stanza and the third we'll look at. Fawcett writes, Before our Father's throne, we pour out ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one. Our comfort and our cares. Line three, we share our mutual woes. Our mutual burdens bear. And often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. You see how they started out? being bound together in the fellowship of kindred minds, the truth, how that's turned in this hymn. Now we're praying for one another. We're praying for one another, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our comforts, our cares. Y'all, this will change the church entirely. And hey, we got a good church. I'm not saying I, I love this church. The pastors love this church. Many of you love this church. But we're being sanctified. We're being sanctified individually. We're being sanctified corporately. And one of the ways this happens is by us walking in the truth, loving in the truth, and praying for one another in the truth. The truth of God's good news, the gospel. So our Christian relationships that are bound in truth are expressed in prayer for one another. But notice what John does next. He goes from walking in truth, loving in truth, praying in truth, to rejoicing in truth, verse 3 and 4. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Now, look at verse 4. He just said, I have rejoiced greatly. And then what does he say in verse 4? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Y'all, this is John the Apostle who was at the transfiguration now put that in comparison if we were at the transfiguration that'd be a pretty great joy right i know it scared them and they hit their floor when they saw christ transfigured but when they left you know that that stayed in their heart and minds you know they found great joy in in being the inner three that saw christ transfigured think about john he saw christ after he rose from the dead after they went off and went fishing, right? They didn't know what to do. You, imagine how much joy John saw when Christ come walking up the beach, right? He saw him restore Peter. Great joy he found in that. I, he had to. Think about when he watched him ascend to the, into heaven. I know there's a sense of which, what are we going to do? He's left us. But there's also a sense and I'm watching the Son of God ascend to the right hand of the Father knowing he's going to come back. That's great joy. But he said, I have no greater joy than this, than to see the brothers testifying to your truth, or to hear that my brothers and children are walking in the truth. What brings us joy? What will we say, I have no greater joy than what? Would it say, be my brothers and sisters walking in the truth? Look, we do find joy in that. Don't get me wrong. But if you're like me, there's still some things that probably take priority over finding that joy, right? There's probably some earthly things where I find joy that that, that I ought to raise the level of my, of my church family. John is setting the example. He's, he's showing us the example. Four guys talking to guys about a faithful, beloved brother. And when you think of what is this truth that he's talking about? When he keeps coming back, you're walking in the truth. They've testified to your truth. The brothers are walking in the truth. I love you in the truth. The ESV study Bible defines it this way. 
Truth as fidelity to Christ and His commands. In other words, Christ is all I need. Christ is where I find my joy. Christ is this message I'm about to go proclaim in truth. I'm working for these, with these people who are proclaiming Him. But not only am I proclaiming Christ, I'm obeying Christ. That is the truth. That's when you're walking in the truth. John Stott explains it this way. He said, whoever walks in truth is an integrated believer in whom there is no dichotomy between profession and practice. On the contrary, there is in him an exact correspondence between creed and conduct. In other words, he practiced what he preached. He walked what he talked. He did what he said he, what, what he, said he was going to believe, what he believed. However, that's another principle for us to learn today. Do we find great joy in our brothers and sisters growing in their knowledge and fidelity to the truth? How often do we think about that? I know sometimes we see it and it's just so obvious. We, we get excited about it. But we're about to get into the missional thrust of this text. Are you joyful that this body just sent 12 missionaries to Ecuador? And I don't mean they just drove right down to Ecuador. This team just went through a a time to get to Ecuador. And they're, they're missing sleep. You get to know people way better when you're sleeping in the airport together for six, eight hours. You know what I mean? But they are going out for the sake of the name. We ought to find great joy in that. This ought to be one of the most exciting times of the year. Every time we send gospel missionaries out that are going to proclaim Christ. Now I'm going to get personal for a minute. Here's how we kind of check our health here individually. Do I find more joy in sports than in the sanctifying work of the gospel in my family of faith? Do I find more joy in the academic accolades of my children than in the conversion of their souls and them crucifying the desires of the flesh? Do I find more joy in my financial security or in growing in my understanding of the eternal security found in Christ alone? Do I find more, jo more joy in hunting deer or pursuing holiness? These are the things that are they're not bad things. But when we begin to let them outweigh the, the great things, Christ and Him alone, that, that's when we start finding our joy in the wrong places. And again, I want the church to be encouraged, not depressed from hearing that, because I see this church walking in the truth. If Chip was to write a letter from Ecuador, I bet it'd say, I appreciate y'all walking in the truth. I love y'all in the truth. I'm praying for y'all in the truth. So take joy in that. But also, we always want to look and see, how am I doing when I compare my life to this text? How am I doing when I think about the way I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ? How am I doing in, in the things I find joy, great happiness, gladness over? And that's when we'll see us grow in our unity as we walk in the truth. Secondly, in the second half of this text, verses 5 through 8, we see John encouraging guys to work in the truth or to be working in the, for the truth. And we see three aspects of this work for the truth. And the first aspect is this, that it's a labor of love. Notice what he says in, in verses 5 and 6a. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers. Strangers as they are who testified to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on a journey in a manner worthy of God. Don't miss it again. He's saying, beloved, dear brother, the one whom I love. It is a faithful thing that you do. It is a good thing you do. It is a thing you are doing in the truth as you labor, as you put forth effort. Do, do you see this? This is work. This isn't something that happens easy for these brothers. Who are these brothers? These, these are expected to be some missionaries that had came through where the church Gaius was at who have now traveled over to where John's at and gave testimony of the church where Gaius was and how they cared for them, how they showed hospitality to them. 
And, and John's finding great joy in this, right? He's hearing of his faithful brother. He's hearing of a faithful church. He's seeing God's mission go from church to church, going out to, for the sake of the name we'll see in a minute. He said, even though they are strangers, you cared for them like they were your own. Even though you didn't know who they are, you cared for them. And he knew that because they testified to his love before the church. Look, we'll tell other people about people we know, but when you say, I'm testifying of their love, that's a whole different level. That's a whole different level of truth. That's a whole different level of understanding. And that's what Gaius has done here. He has loved these brothers through caring for these brothers. And again, this is another area of encouragement for the church here. If you go to Ecuador, if you've been to Ecuador, you're going to hear a body down there that loves this church. A body that, that finds great joy in every time we come. A body that, that, that hates when we leave. And it's because of the way you cared for them. It's because of the way you showed love to them in truth. Uh, here's just a few ways that I know of. And again, I'm a short timer, so y'all know many more. But the church helped them harvest their crops. The church helped them wire or sow in the crop. The church helped them witness to the community. The church helped them learn sound doctrine. Helps them disciple their children. Any any wonder why they love this church? Because you've been faithful, you've cared for them, you've loved them, and they know it. Um, now I, I saw it on the other side too. This summer when we went down, or this October, whenever it was, James, I can't remember. But anyway, we got to go up up the mountain and teach a Bible study in a home. Well, first they showed us hospitality by receiving the truth, right? They sat there and we talked and it, we were done. And then all of a sudden some other people walked in. They said, hey, they didn't hear it. Can you teach again? We're like, oh, okay. Wasn't prepared for that, but we'll see how it goes. But then what they, they would not let us leave until they fed us a meal. Now, when they feed you a meal in Ecuador, it's a little different than feeding a meal here. We can run down to Zaxby's and get a chicken finger platter. They go out there and they kill the chicken. They go out there and dig up the potatoes and feed you what they had in their yard, what they had on their farm. A whole different level of hospitality. But they love the church. They desire to show hospitality to the church. And again, this is a hospitable church. I'm not saying we're not. It, it, but this is the, these are the things that we find joy in. It's a labor of love. This church loves sending people out to proclaim Christ. But not only is it a labor of love, it's a labor worthy of sacrifice. Look at 6b and 7. You will be well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Now here's one of the different things about this letter. If you open up just the letter to the Philippians, Jesus Christ is plastered almost every other sentence, every other verse, if not every. I mean, Jesus' name is all over that letter. This letter, he doesn't even mention Jesus' title, his name. But when he says, for the sake of the name, that's Jesus. You can be sure that's where he's pointing us to Christ. Not only is the truth in Christ, but the name they go out for the sake of is Christ. And this, is, this layer of sending people out for the sake of the name is worthy of sacrifice. Why? Look what he says in verse 6. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Now, there's not many things you would say. Now, I know we do all things for the glory of God. Don't, don't, I'm not questioning that. But for you to say, hey, when you do this, this is to be done in a manner worthy of God, you're saying something about it. And that mission that he's talking about is the mission of making Christ known to the nations. And he said, when you do that, you invest in that. You commit to that. You labor for that. You love in that. You make sure that's done in a manner worthy of God. And again, I'm going to encourage the church. I saw it this week. They wanted to take crayons. People lined up bringing crayons. Writing checks for crayons. When that was filled, what else can we do? We need glue sticks. Here's 100 glue sticks. I saw people handing people cash. I saw people writing checks. Because they want to invest in making Christ known. And it's a worthy thing you do. 
So we're to do it in a manner worthy of God. Why? Because they're not accepting nothing from the Gentiles, he says. They're not asking the pagans to invest in kingdom work. Why? Because the church ought to do that. The people of God invest in kingdom work. In the name going out. Here's the reality, though, y'all. A lot of things are easier now than they used to be. Missions ain't going to get easier. It's going to get harder and harder to do gospel missions. And I say that because plane tickets have doubled in price. It used to be 600, now it's 12. Fuel just to go to airports doubled. Y'all know, y'all know this. It's going to cost more and more to invest in kingdom work. That's why we have to understand it's worthy of sacrifice. It's worthy of sacrificing our time. It's worthy of sacrificing our finances. I mean, you think about the, the disciples, they sacrificed their life. John wasn't martyred, but he was in exile for the sake of the name. So what are we willing to sacrifice for the sake of the name? One commentary points to the Didache. This was an early church manual that provided, that said that a preacher was to be provided enough food to enable him to get to the next location. That's traveling in faith, right? Hey, I'm going to feed you today, but you got to get down to Birmingham to eat tomorrow. That, that's not even the Dave Ramsey plan, right? He says, store up enough cash and then go. They're, they're saying, I'll feed you, now you go. And depend on the church to feed you next. But they knew their mission was worthy of this. Their mission was worthy in trusting God and God's people. And that's why we see in verse 8 that this labor requires cooperation. Verse 8, John writes, Therefore we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Hey, I, I like scripture that's easy to understand, don't y'all? This one's easy to understand. He said, therefore, because of all this work being done in the truth, because it's worthy of God, because it's a labor of love, because I love my dear brother who's being faithful in hospitality, you ought to go and support them. You ought to support these missionaries going out for the name of Christ. You ought to support fellow workers like this so that Christ may be known. And then he answers why. That we may be fellow workers for the truth. We are called to cooperate in gospel ministry. But we are not called to se separate our partnerships because of... We are not to partner with just anybody apart from being bound in the truth. There you go. Whoever we partner with in gospel ministry must affirm the doctrinal truth that we do. If we're going to partner with people in plant churches, if we're going to partner with people going out for the sake of the name, we want those people to be able to preach in our pulpits. And if we won't have somebody preach in our pulpit because of a doctrine they teach, why would we send them out to a local church that's young and impressionable that they might be led astray in their doctrine and practice? And here's the, again, the truth of the matter. It's getting harder and harder to find people that we align with. And it's not because we're some really strict, hey, you got to believe these 47 things. But it's because more and more people are caving to the truth of the Scriptures. And it's not just me. Listen to, listen, this is what John wrote in the second letter, verses 9 and 10. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. You think truth was important? You think truth is important to the gospel partners we, we partner with? Absolutely. And, you know, that may sound harsh, but John said, don't even let them in your house if they don't teach the truth we believe. So we need to affirm that our gospel partners teach the same biblical truth that we teach, that they teach the same doctrine that we teach, that we might be fellow workers in the truth. Now I want us to look again at that hymn, the last few verses on page 387. That, that one may not have all the verses in it, but I'm going to read you three more. Verse 4, when we are called to part, 
it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Now I'm going to stop right there. Because again, when you are united in gospel truth, when you are not united in the mission to make disciples of Christ, to make Christ known, there's a bond there that you can't describe. That's why when we went to leave Ecuador last time, and I'm sure it's every time, they weep. Because they don't want us to leave. Because we're united in the truth. The, the missionary down there said, I love First Baptist Springville because y'all's teaching is so precise. You know what that means? We teach the truth. And he loves that. And he knows it is good for the church. And the church loves it because they don't want you to leave when you leave. And trust me, most of us, when you go down there, you don't want to leave either. Because it's such a precious work to be engaged in. So I hope you'll find joy in knowing that. Listen to these last two lines. This glorious hope revives our courage by the way. While we each in expectation lives and waits to see the day. That day Jesus returns. We're proclaiming his name until he comes back. Next week we'll, we'll be engaged in the Lord's Supper and we're going to do it, you know when? Until he comes. We'll talk more about that next week. The final line of the hymn. From sorrow, toil, and pain and sin we shall be free. Hey, we sung that earlier, didn't we? When we shall be freed from sinning, amen? That's another truth that brings great joy. Knowing that one day these old bodies that are, have sin in us but not reigning over us will be completely glorified. And we will be freed from sinning. And perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. When he comes back and gets his bride and we receive those glorified bodies, no more sin, no more division, even in brothers, let's just be honest, even when brothers and sisters love each other, sometimes there's angst between us. Not then. It's going to be perfect unity. Truth increases our unity now, but when Christ returns, it is a perfect unity. Free from sin, free from pain. And this Christ-focused love and, and truth will reign through all eternity. That ought to bring us great joy. That ought to be the message we proclaim. The truth of Christ, His salvation, and ultimately His, His return and our glorification. Now do you hear the affection for one another that we will have as we walk and work for the truth of the gospel? I hope it brings you great joy this morning. And I hope this week as you go out that you pray for those 12 missionaries by name. And you pray that all goes well with them. That their travel, their, their interaction with the communities, their gospel proclamation, all goes well. And I pray that their souls are strengthened. When they come back, they would be on fire to, to share the gospel. Hey, we've got some young people on this team that are going to be giving their testimony for the first time. That's big. And we pray that that's life-changing for them. That all of a sudden, pastors might be raised out of that group. Missionaries. That, hey, they want to go spread the name somewhere else. And all this for the glory of God. As we close in prayer, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I want to read a Puritan prayer. Because th this prayer, as, as, I, as I read it, you're going to hear these same truths coming from the words of these prayer. So just pray this with me as I pray. And we'll close, but this will be a great reminder of what it means to walk and work in the truth. Let's pray.